welcome to the On The Line podcast. I'm your host, Matt, as always. We have Chris Meldrum, and I'm pleased to announce that we now have Josh as a full-time host. On the show today, we have founder of Kite Forge and Kite Life, John Baresi. Welcome to the studio, John. Thank you, guys. How's it going? Uh, pretty good. You know, it's, uh, it's odd times, but I'm, I'm having fun. Thank you for coming on and talking with us. So, um, in the lockdown, how, how's it been going for you? Mm, the, that, it, for me, it's, I, I don't know, it's, I think it's a little bit atypical in that I'm, I'm kind of a homebody as it is in my, um, it's not like I go to a nine to five location to work. So, um, the main thing for me, really, the way that I felt it is that I've not been able to travel and to, to see my friends and to, um, to stand on fields um, with flyers, which is, that's, that's what I love at all skill levels. I'm just to be there next to people. And that I've, um, I felt that very deeply. Um, and anybody that knows me well enough knows that it's, it's um, so deeply connected to just my general well-being, being able to fly and express myself that way. So um, it's been, it's been most interesting just kind of finding adaptations and ways to um, uh, kind of cycle some of that same energy or, or inspirations or, or interactions without actually getting face to face. So that's a long answer, but um, on the whole of it, I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm looking forward to whatever's ahead. Yeah. I've uh, still looking out the window, still waiting for uh, Bojo as we like to call him to uh, release some of the restrictions so I can go out and fly a kite. I did admittedly have a short blast, um, after work outside the office but the conditions were not ideal so i, I packed up pretty quick um mm -hmm. so josh uh, john everyone uh seems to know you i think you're pretty famous in the kiting world um but what i want to know is how long have you actually been flying for um I, I it's it's long enough that I'm always fudgy on exactly like whether it's the, the the 29th year or the 31st year um, sort of thing. But it was August of uh, 1990 that I, I first picked up a sport kite and bought one the next morning, and um, just dropped in hardcore and never looked back. So we'll say loosely 30 years, but August of 90 is is when I started flying um, dual line, and then in September, just the month following, I picked up um, uh, quad line. And then during that whole time um, where I started flying kites in Berkeley um, area, there was a lot of single line and show kites, the early show kites and that kind of thing. So I've been involved in kiting um, in, in many of its various flavors for, for just about 30 years now. 30 years. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. That is a hell of a yeah, long for, time. For, 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 for context of age, you're, you're looking at a starting age of, of, of 15. And then um, I'm now, as of today, I'm 44. I'll be 45 on, on, in June. So uh, what's your first kiting memory then? Um, first kiting memory, um, I have none of the traditional ones that I hear from spectators and people all through the years, sticks and paper, like I don't have any of that. Um, quite literally, my first kite experience, I was sitting uh, eating lunch with my father at the, the Marina Green. Um, it's a, a park area in San Francisco, a notable, beautiful park area where um, it was really famous for kite flying back in the, the early 90s and late 80s. And I saw someone flying a Team Hawaiian dual line kite, um, big, anybody that's seen one of these things, but for those that don't know, it's, it's an over an eight foot kite. It's a lot of sail, huge amount of pull and, um, and, and loud and, and wicked. And I think I weighed, I was unusually small for my age. I looked like I was about 11 at the age of 15, probably 70 pounds dripping wet. And so I walked out there and I asked the guy a question. I said, what's up? I don't, maybe I asked him if it had an engine or something funny, but, um, I, I, he, I don't know how it exa exactly it segued to it, but the guy let me try his kite. Um, and so again, this is early nineties. The, the, this kite's valued at probably 300 bucks and it's a beast and he's handing it to this little kid. And I don't think it was dangerous, but the fact that this guy that I'd never met was allowing me to try this kite that still stands with me today. Um, and I, I got my hands on it. He said, right is right, left is left. And I did a loop and crashed the kite and dragged on my butt all the way down the grass. And that moment right there, it was that moment when I, I got up, I had this grass stain on my tail and 
I'm like just grin on my face and like all my dad heard for the next like 16 hours was like, dad, I want to kite, dad, I want to kite, dad, I want to kite. <laughs> um, and so uh, we went to the, the, all the local kite shops in the city um, at that time, but eventually ended up at uh, Highline Kites in Berkeley, California on um, Tom McAllister, who's still a dear friend today. And, uh, and he took really good care of me. He showed me how to, how to start in with the dual line, got me on good lines and, um, made sure that I knew how to be successful at even a beginner kite. And, uh, man, I, I just never, ever looked back. I think I threw, uh, I flew every day for like the next three months, like literally every day for three months, nonstop, like nine in the morning to eight at night, just going, going, going. That's, um, that's crazy. That's crazy. Josh, go for it. Good question. You've got to love people's origin stories, and I think that's a pretty great uh, origin story. But have you had any connection with the Hawaiian since? Uh, is it still one of your like great kites in, in the bag kind of thing, or is that have you moved on from the Hawaiian? Mm, that's a, that's a fun question. No, I, I I don't I don't think I ever arrived at the Hawaiian to be a quite awesome movie, right? That was just my first taste. Um, what I a great segue is is the first kite that I actually went and bought was a a cheetah by Sky Toys. Um, and that was the, the remake of Action Kite's Sky Dart. So now this is where we're getting into like real kite origin stories um, back in the very, very early days, which I had come in just at the tail end of the beginning days, right? So I was there as standoffs were being added to the spinoff for top of the line. Um, I, Right, right. I mean, this is this is that era, and 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 all of the kites were set really far nose back, so they were all stally. Um, you didn't do any slackline tricks, but um, yeah. So I bought a cheetah, um, and then from there, I pretty quickly got into um, uh, the interceptor um, from Craig Wong, Paragon Kites. He was supportive of me in the early days, as was Peter Werba, um, a slightly more familiar name, who made the XTC. Um, Some were kind of connected with the, the invention of the axle. Um, and then uh, ultimately, I, I kind of landed on um, Miguel Rodriguez's California Wasp, which is a, an extremely flat, very fast, very loud, very stall, tip stab oriented kind of kite. Um, this is the kite that the black hole was invented on. So if, if you know, so I bought my beginner kite. I tried a whole bunch of stuff, but then, like as I started to kind of find my first personality as a kite player. It was on that California Wasp, and it was such a strong, aggressive movement. Um, Miguel Rodriguez himself had this I – mean, he almost looked like a matador. You know, it, it looked like a, like a bullfighter with, like, a ring of fire around his head doing tip stabs. And the, the whole thing just had so much, like, gnash to it. It was, it was really impressive. Um, so, yeah, that, that was the kite that attracted me the most, although I, I evolved out of that. Um, you know, I'd say it's every two to three years. That was a long, long answer, but <laughs> – yeah, right on. All right, I have one. All right. mm. You have the Kaijira, the Chimera, and the Jid. I'm sensing a little bit of a pattern here. Do you have like a big mystical book somewhere that you pick out names? How do you come up with your names? <laughs> a good question. Um, hmm. Well, like any kite designer, of course, you, you look really, really hard for one that's not been used before. That, <laughs> that's like a really good one. Um, but once you get past that, um, so for me, uh, I'll just go into it. So the, the kaiju, for example, is, um, uh, pardon my, 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 my Anglo pronunciation, but kaiju, whatever it is, is, is a Japanese word for the monster genre. And so that might be the little sprite who's carrying a cup of water on his head. And if he spills the water, he dies, right? He's in the woods. That's a kaiju, a little gentle thing, all the way up to Godzilla. He's also a kaiju. So it's this big monster realm, this arena. And so the, the idea of flying on the short line, um, if you've seen the rodeo style where I have one hand slid up the lines and I'm actually swinging the kite around a bit like a lariat or a rodeo, um, just the whole thing was much more monstrous in its potentia for me than um, traditional flying. So the, yeah, the, the kaiju was kind of a natural, natural title for that. Um, the chimera, um, yeah, it was, it was a blend. It was my first uh, commercial dual line design. And um, that was a blend of some of the things that I've been looking at in the past. Uh, but uh, yeah, nothing, nothing particularly unique about that name. But the name uh, Jin, uh, Jin is, is the old Arabic word for genie. Um, but not like the Robin Williams blue, you know, uh, give you three wishes kind of. The, the, the Jin is like, you cannot tame the Jin. 
it's this old dark thing that comes in the night. <laughs> um, so I think what I, what I mostly look for is, um, cause I, I'm so connected with my kites emotionally, right? So I'm looking for this smoky finish, if you will, this, this, this animus, this kind of, um, something that I identify with in the name itself. So, um, yeah, I don't know, there's no exact formula, um, as it was asked, but, um, there's definitely kind of a sense that I look for, and that's that's it. As I want something that it does. Ah, I hear, here's the key: it doesn't answer itself at first glance. That's one of the things that I love. And if you look at much of the um, uh, conceptual uh, branding or presentation, as you will, that I do, um, you know, a lot of things like iQuad. You know, you'll see it, and you're like, you're just going to sit there for like 10 seconds and scratch your head and go, "What's iQuad?" Like what's kaiju? What's Jin? And Dajin? Like <laughs> I love that moment of uncertainty and unclarity. Um, and uh, just to to round that out, uh, manufacturers, as a matter of fact, Chimera, for example, K Y M E R A, that is the phonetic spelling of Chimera. And that was um, that was a request by Into the Wind because it, it, like they're concerned with it, you won't be able to pronounce the name. And for me, like I love that there are people walking around the world saying Dajin when it's actually Jin. Um, you know, it's just something fun about that for me. But I'm a boutique guy. So you like to keep people guessing, basically. I I I like I like someone to not be able to just simply walk through an equation. Like I, I, I like them to be able to kind of stop. You, you kind of do that once right, once left. Like this is not the normal. And then right, it, 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 how to say it, for me, it triggers participation. It, it triggers them uh, uh, to be more in the moment, to look at something and ask that moment one to three things, as opposed to just passing through and go, great. It's a, 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 a triple rocket. You know, it's like it, it, there's no thought process there, you know? Yeah, it's interesting because uh, I guess you, you yeah, you're wanting the the kites themselves to be um, more engaging, even even with just the name, um, get people yeah. thinking about it. Yeah. Well, I, I think I think Matt, one of the one of the big things here is that um, none of the kites that I've that I've made, um, especially under Kiteforge, most especially under Kiteforge, none of them were designed with the. I, I, I want to make sure I word this really clearly for anybody that hears this is, is none of them were designed for you, right? They weren't designed for Joe who walks into the shop and buys a kite. At no point did I build the gin with Brett, um, which we'll, we'll get into and go, okay, how are we going to make this product? That, that never, ever, ever, not once in the slimmest freaking sliver of an equation ever entered anything. We wanted our kite. Our kite, we, we know, right? We know what we want. And myself, especially for many, many years, I have been using this tool, I will say at least as equally as anybody else in the world, and I wanted to close all of the gaps. I wanted to patch all of the holes. I, I wanted to fix everything. And, and then again, Brett Marshall coming up very, very quickly strong amount of passion and a very natural talent um, adding to that. Like we both just sat down and we said, man, we are going to make our thousand folded steel kite. Like that's the, <laughs> you got to climb up the mountain and go like meditate with the guy for a month to get one of these things kind of thing, because it, it had to be made for us. And, and I, I hit my quads. I'm going to say probably harder than anybody else in the world. I, I hit that thing really hard. So once we had that built and even working with my factory people, who are also kite flyers, by the way. At, I made it very clear to them. I said, even as we build this thing up, I don't ever want you to be counting the value of what's going into it. I don't want you to go, well, what's this bungee cost? And what's this? I, at the end, man, when we got this thing made, whatever it is, and it's been the same for every design that we've done so far and every design that we do in the future, they will all be made to survive and be enjoyed by me and the people that I deal with throughout the course of a year at all skill levels, right? That's, that's the key. It's not made as a product. It's made, it's made for the very act itself, right? That's, that's the premise. So once I have that made out, then we figure out what that costs to make. And um, so far, fortunately, we've, we've been in the very fortunate position of not having to shave off any of the, the details and the, the build ideas that we put into it. We've been able to take exactly what we built um, to our ideal and bring that 
directly to market. Um, granted, it not at a tremendous volume. You know, we can't make a whole lot of them because it is so so process oriented. But um, yeah, that's that's what's behind the build. I, I don't even remember the original question, but I think you got the gist of it. No, it's, it's interesting because um, you're saying what uh, a lot of what the other kite designers um, that I've spoken to have said is that they make the kites for themselves first and foremost. Um, you know, speaking to mm -hmm. Josh and the Pulse, the Pulse was created for him, not to to form a business. It was created specifically to to serve a purpose that he wanted to serve. Um, and I think the same goes for, for quite a lot of the popular, um, you know, if you take the, the popular kites from each discipline, I think you'll find that it's, uh, it's quite a similar ethos. Um, so going on then, this is a, a, a bit of a lighthearted question, I guess lighthearted, but it, it, it might, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see, we'll see what happens. Now, um, one thing I like to ask is about, um, the, the two disciplines, so dual line and quad line. If you could only fly one discipline for the rest of your life, would it be dual line or quad line? Quad line. Notice the hesitation. And I actually <laughs> yeah, you really, you really, you. really, just, really just, hesitated just, there. Uh, you really had to think now, about that hard. Yes. Now, let me qualify that. Let me expand on that. The reason is that. I can manifest 70 to 75% of the same animus, the same energy, the same ah, in a quad that I can get out of a duel. What it can't give me is slack line. I can't get slack line and I can't get that just like, like jump off the cliff and survive or not hit the tip stand. Like duel line is, is all in. We had this conversation in another one of the, the on the line um, interactions, but it was, it, it, you know, dual line is like it's oh, how to say it's all in. So what I mean by that is is like with a quad, where the, every time when you go from origin to destination, you do have the ability to influence your speed and your stopping and rotational. And I mean, it is one hundred percent potential to control. And I can use all of that to sort of animate like a dual line, sort of. With the dual line, though, on the other side, I, there's a lot of things that I can't do, ultimately. So I, I would lose far more. So uh, quad, I can, I can fly in an alley. I can fly in the most god-awful spaces. Um, and I can, especially now, we're starting to kind of develop more and more of a slack line satisfaction out of the style of flying as well, things like the clam roll and new tricks coming online. Um, but I love both kites, and I... And I I almost, I almost resent you for asking me the question, but I understand the question. And with that, I will stay with quad final answer. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, you know, I, I have to ask the difficult questions. Uh, that's, that's just part of it. Well, you um, know, you know, okay, you asked for it though, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, going to go yeah, back yeah, right yeah. And, 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 and I, and I, okay, so yeah, of course. So anybody who sits on one side of the fence, all right, I'm, I'm letting that hang for dramatic pause. Anybody that sits on one side of the fence, good for you that's what i got to say <laughs> yeah. really good for you so awesome. I th have fun I i'm glad that you enjoy it but that's the end of your conversation it is naturally whereas yeah. if someone is flying both kinds of kites let me go down the line scott augenbaugh lamb hawk carl robertshaw gregory rains richard debray on and on and on jo josh mitchison on and on and on dual line quad line duo mastery is the bomb that's that's it. It's skin on wind, baby. It's, it, it's all different ways of holding onto a frame. So when you start to polarize on one side, make sure that it's because I only drink Coors beer, man. That's my style. I like Coors. I'm gonna sit on the patio and drink this kind. That's cool, baby. That's all good. But if you want to be a real connoisseur, you've got to know and taste everything. So I'm I'm down with both, and I think it's really really important that people kind of remember that. Even if you don't stick with other disciplines, trying them will enhance the discipline you do love that's most certain if if you didn't like that question you're not you're not you're not going to like the next one um i think i, I, love know, these I, questions. I think Bring i know the, I think <laughs> are I know you going to like the answer no i think i know the answer <laughs> and i think i know the answer good, based, good. On, based on the answer of one of your previous questions um i think Roll those is, days, I, i've got go. a feeling this is going to be really easy for you um if you could only fly one kite 
for the rest of time, what would it be? Hmm. Um, I, I, I'm going to be specific because obviously the kites that I fly, I made for myself. So it's kind of a no brainer, but I will say more specifically, I would probably choose to fly. God, it's a hard one. Mid vent or extra vent gym. And I would probably say mid vent just because I can still fly nothing and I can still fly up to 20, 25 if I manage the kite. So yeah, I'm going to say mid vent gym is what I would fly if I can only take one kite for the rest of history. Well, you made it for a reason. So, uh, I like I like the fact that you're uh, standing by what you made. So that's cool. That's good. That's good. We would we wouldn't want it any other way. So, Josh, you got right. a question? Oh, Chris, go for it. I have one. Uh, might be kind of a hard one. Uh, back to what you were when he asked you if you could only fly quads or duels. You chose quads. Now, someone that has never flown a quad at all. If you if they asked you to describe the feeling you get when you fly a quad, what would you say? Um, I would say that, and you said you said specifically, if if I would describe the feeling that I have when I fly the kite, I feel yes. like a sniper at a thousand yards who knows how to drop a shell. That's what I feel like. I feel like a sniper, stone that is cold great. baby, because I know. I know where I can put it. I know I can put it at length, and there's no question about it. That's why you put me here for it. That's how I feel about quad because of that complete control from origin to destination. Um, whereas, like, just to fill it in, if you asked me the same question and I had to answer dual line, um, then I would say it'd be like, I don't know, jumping out of a parachute, uh, jumping out of a plane, and I've got my own wings that I fashioned. And it's like, you know, you're committed, man. <laughs> you better know how to fly or you're not going to make it. <laughs> Awesome, um, answer, and, awesome and, and, and to that end, I mean, dual line, uh, a, a team is very similar, right? Quad team is super easy. The hardest, hardest, single hardest maneuverable kite job in the world is good dual line team flying far and away. No question. Now, I know a lot of us are getting stir crazy and we're, we're, we're waiting to travel and get out there again. If you had a free ticket and you could just leave tomorrow and go anywhere, anywhere in the world, where would you travel to? Um, assuming that everything else was was freed up to support that, right? Everybody else is normal like I am. We're quarantine <laughs> free at this Cher point. Okay, then I'm going to Cervia, Italy, baby. I'm Cervia, Cervia. I'm still learning how to say it. I think it's Cervia. Um, miraculous, amazing. Um, you can find live videos of me just going on and waxing romance about the event um, during it. Um, <sighs> It's it's an art festival, is its reputation, um, much like Fano and a couple of other events. But this is really um, this is a almost indescribable, right? I have to kind of wrap it up in a few different things. Um, so, Serbia, Italy. Uh, Claudio Capelli is the original founder of this event. Um, Claudio, of course, is he's one of our thirty-five or forty-year kite world travelers. He's been long time involved. Um, and now his daughter, uh, Katerina, um, not now, but for a number of years now, um, Katerina has, has, has been uh, taking over the reins, bringing the entire um, organization, which is called Artevento, um, into the social media world and, and introducing her own artistic and, and aesthetic concepts to it. And um, all of that really kind of continues at Cherve between Katerina and, Ka and Claudio with the people that they invite. A simple example, like uh, you go to another festival and there's this, I don't know, when I was in Serbia, at no point did I feel like I was in a room with a bunch of gunslingers. Um, I didn't feel the, and this is a natural thing, right? I'm not attacking anybody. This is just, we're human, right? We're kind of dumb. So five uh, well-known kite personalities show up at a festival inside. We're all naturally managing this kind of, you know, who's bigger and who's smaller and, you know, all this kind of crap is going on. And that's natural. But at Serbia, what I noticed was a very natural release of that, which we, we all work towards. But in Serbia, it just happened quite readily. And so what I found was that, um, ah, comparison was eliminated. I think that's one of the ways I would describe it. Um, I I didn't sense any comparison. It was just like, wow, look at that. And then something else is added to it. And then you're just like, wow, look at that. <laughs> it's always expansive as opposed to 
um, kind of replacement or, or one bettering oriented. It was just like everything that went out got bigger. And one of the places that that, um, as a sport kite flyer myself, one of the places that I, I saw it readily manifest was in the demo section. So for only one to two hours a day, they do real demos. Most of the rest of the time is all free form creation by everybody that, that attends. But during this one and a half to two hours, so we know that most of the events that we go to when we do demos, there's a flight order. You go to the sound tent and you communicate with the sound guy. And you, okay, I'm number seven. I'm flying after Josh. And you, you go wait. And they, no, no, no. Serbia, first of all, they've got a round field. Round. There's no corners. There's no dead air. You're completely surrounded by people. And there's like, say, there's 15 of us standing in a circle. It's like a dance floor. It's more like you may maybe seen uh, b-boys or break dancers. You know, they just like you sense the opening on the floor and whoever's the most ready naturally arises to fill that space. And it ends up being this kind of dueling banjos, natural flow. You just kind of look around and go, oh, I guess it's my turn. It, very spontaneous and very organic. Um, and, and again, that is just another, I could go on and on. I would waste two or three of these shows just talking about Serbia. But, but I hope that that is, is, is representative, that you have these incredibly strong personalities and masterful representations from all the genres, all on the same time zone. I mean, like internally, externally, you name it. It's just really beautiful. So Serbia, Italy, that's where I would go, Chris, right now. And I would probably just live there. Matter of fact, I'm not coming home. If I can get my son over there, I'll just stay there. That, that's a well put answer. I've seen last time you told me about Serbia, I actually took it upon myself to go on Google and do some search, and it is truly beautiful. I hope to visit someday. Well, mm. certainly one that we're looking to attend. It's amazing. Um, John, I want to ask you. Um, obviously, I it's quite common knowledge that you do the quad clinics, and I, I've been lucky enough to work on them with you for a couple. Um, at which point in your sort of kite career did you turn your idea into wanting to give something back to the pilots and help develop other people as well as your own kind of personal growth? Wonderful, wonderful segue, Josh. Um, I have to kind of take it in two stages. Um, so you, you, you prefaced with the clinic, but the um, I think that the ideological shift, and I, and I, you and I have spent a lot of time together. We're good friends, so I, I can say this directly. You, as you have transitioned through this first maturation point, right? That's teenage and your twenties, and right, it's we're yeah. discovering what that means. So, so I've gone through a lot of that, that cycle myself, and <clears throat> kite life. So predating the clinics and that kind of thing, kite life was my first kind of shift. So from 1991 was my first competition. I was in master's class by end of 92. And then I competed pretty much nonstop all the way till about 2005. But in 2002, approximately. Um, so I have to preface this by saying it's a little bit self um, self motivated. And certainly, especially in the early days, it definitely was I, I won't hold any bones about that. Um, so when you're, when you're so prolific in something, right, I, I remember I, I was rising star for American Kite Magazine, a quarterly full-color publication with a national circuit. East Coasters had to fly to San Francisco and West Coasters had to fly to Wildwood to get you right. This is a different era. This is a massive era. It literally was like, like NASCAR for kites. It was really unbelievable. I mean, you had to really suck to not be sponsored. And so part of my motivation originally was to preserve the fact that I have a certain championship. I mean, I just, you know, there, there it is, but also everybody else. I want to make sure that Dodd's championships were preserved and, and, and Russ Falk and, and all, and these people, Bob Childs, these people back in the days that already their names are disappearing just because our sport has a low enough level of cohesion that we can't hold onto our history, our fabric. Our right, that data is slipping, and so my first motivation to go back to your question was satori kites.com. S A T O R I dash kites, and you can find some of it on if you go on like the, the Wayback Machine, the, the old archival systems they have on the internet, you can find little bits of it, missing graphics. But what it was was a website where I had gone out and I'd communicated with, I think at high point, I had a hundred and 
53 competitor bios from all over the frickin' world. So you go onto the main page and there's, you can click by country, you can click alphabetically and you find, you open it up. And if you were competing at that time, you'd open up Josh Mitchison and there it is. And there's a, a mugshot of you. And I'd try and grab like two or three photos of you in action. And then if I could, I'd try to find a video link. This is pre-YouTube, mind you. I'm literally trying to find like, like repositories of videos on freaking line. So and you so were we trying to build like Wikipedia. Type. In a sense, yeah, and, and, and then alongside that, directly and consciously parallel, I was trying to build an archive that would serve as a an announcer database so that you could just open up the website and then print off your bios for the people who are coming to your events. Um, that the people that have put in so much effort and so much thought and mastery that their, their cumulative championships and, and efforts would be recognized. Um, you know, that, that baseball card... I made it little, you know, anything you can do for those folks. So this is that motivation. It was me and, and all these competitors. I'm like, your kites are awesome. Why can't we be awesome or in history and all of that? Okay. So, so I'm working on that. And, and while I'm working on this, this is coming to its kind of apex and it has a limited growth value. Okay. So it is literally what I've described it as so far. It never went any further, even until it expired. And, and what happened though, was during that time, Mike Gallard, who I was on a team with, Captain Eddie's Flying Circus. We went to world championships in 97. Um, he, in 98, had formed KiteLife.com. This was his idea. It was his business. In the, 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 the vacuum left by the closing of Kite Lines Magazine and American Kite Magazine, both in 98. So in 98 to 99 is the forming of Kite Life. And it was the first easy, the first electronic magazine. Um, everything, you can see the original files that, that, he, that I got from them, they were done in, in, in uh, what do they call that? Oh, front page, <laughs> Microsoft front page, right? I mean, it was just massively way back. So anyway, we're getting to this point. So he's got Kite Life and I've got Satori Kites. And Mark, uh, Mike calls me up one day, he says, hey, John, he says, he says I, I'm really busy. And so Mike at that point had become chair of the American Kite Flyer Association Sport Kite Committee. Um, he had built the Amer the World Sport Kite Championships with Gomberg and a number of other players. He was very busy. He had also taken on editorship of the American Kite Flyers Association magazine called Kiting and brought it back to a glossy full-color format from what had been a black and white for two decades or more. So it, to, to say the least, his plate was full. He's now working on this committee. He's working on the magazine, not Kite Life. So he calls me and says, John, will you, will, you, will you do this? Will you manage the site? And you can have the, uh, the advertising revenue. And it wasn't very much. It's only a couple of advertisers, one of which was Into the Wind, quick, quick plug, intothewind.com. Kite Life's original sponsor still with us, like the only paying sponsor still. Anyway, um, God love them. So, so I'm, so I'm working on Kite Life and so I'm building it and, and it, remember, it's just an easy, it's just a once every two to three months, a release of 10 to 12 articles as a digest. And so at a, at a certain point I installed the forum and I'm, I'm like, okay, cool. Here's this forum. And now there's, there's this small community, there's people interacting. And this is about 2004, 2005, about when this is happening. Um, and I got involved with Kite Life 2003. Okay. So I've got the forum, and now I'm starting to get videos. I'm starting to find videos. I've got actual five-minute videos of Richard Debray dropping bombs in France, and I can get that stuff on a website. I mean, this is, this is, this is new stuff, right? We didn't have YouTube at this time. So I'm, I'm gathering these videos, and I get them into a download area. So anyway, the, the moral of the story is that I'm, I'm finally starting to get all this media together. I'm starting to see this big picture. How does the forum interact? And how does the, the community interact? And then what's the importance of the video and the inspiration? And so this, this whole big organism is starting to form. And I, I will never forget, I, I called Mike up one day, and I said, man, Mike, Dude, I, I, you gave me an easy, <laughs> and I've now got, I've got the beginnings of this, this forum, this archive, this membership base, this, like all of this. And if I go these next steps, I need to know that it's, um, that it's something that I'm investing into myself as well. You know, and he and I were dear friends, right? I'm really dear friends. So he understood. And, um, and, and he gave me the thing, lock, stock, and barrel. And not to say, and there's no physical, I mean, it wasn't like an, a, like a, a tremendous asset that he physically handed to me, but, but he gave me the Kite Life brand. In 2005, I quit my last day job 
and um, and and struggled um, eating burritos and hot dogs for <laughs> the next decade, basically um, putting this thing together. But that, to answer your question, that's when I first started to get the taste of of more than just me stepping onto a field or sitting in a room and talking for my own benefit. It's that, that sort of thing. That that transition happened there about the clinic where you originally tied it in. All of that kite life energy and that sort of um, evolution, for better or worse, of my own character and my own self. Um, I found myself standing on a beach in Long Beach in 2005, giving my first weekend dual line clinic. And on Sunday afternoon, for one hour, be like, hey, anybody want to know about quads? <laughs> it was really like that. And then two years later, like I can't, I can't book a dual line clinic. Like I can't, like quad line clinic. We're we're filling them up at 30 with with iQuad, um, and this is the whole rise of iQuad. Um, yeah, yeah. So it was about 2005 is is when I got into the whole instruction thing. Um, and you know me, man, I could bounce all over the room. So I'm gonna pinch it right there and leave you with the answer that you actually asked for. <laughs> it's quite amazing, though. It's, it's always nice to hear the the back end of something which has got a front end which you totally wouldn't expect. Um, yeah, yeah. That's really great. That. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, and I, God, I hope somebody asked me like deeper questions about the teaching aspect as well, because that's um, there's nothing better than I than I've ever done. I'm not going to answer it without a question. So you hit it when you're ready. That was actually my <laughs> next question. I was going to ask you what Good. what about teaching that you enjoy so much? Um, the first and foremost, I love kites, Chris. You know me. I love, I love it. I love flying. I love, I love how someone feels when they find even just that first shine of the connection with the experience, with a single line, dual line, indoor, out. It doesn't really matter, does it? It's all really quite irrelevant. That point when you are able to, when you know that your own character has influenced the behavior of this kite in a positive way, in a way that you want, or that it brought you through rhythm, an experiential thing that you get to take home with you. That's beautiful. Um, I, I can't say that enough. I don't know what that makes of me. I don't, I, and I don't care. But honestly, that is the thing that I feel the most. You asked me if I could only fly one kite for the rest of my life. If you asked a different question, you asked me if I could only fly or only teach for the rest of my life. I'm, I, I want to shed a, 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 a tiny, tiny inside tear over that, that very concept. I mean, really, it hits me deeply. I love kites, man. You can hear it in the tone of my voice, okay? Um, but if I had to choose, I would teach. It, that's it. If I could be 40 and fly awesome kites for the rest of my life, or if I could be 55 and 60 maybe sitting in a wheelchair guiding other people where I can still stand up and participate a little bit. Sometimes I would choose the latter um, because that experience is so beautiful. It's such an amazing thing for people. And there's so few, I'm going to speak pointedly and then we can break span on this later, but there's so few roads to competency in my opinion, in kiting. Um, really proven roads to competency. Oh, yes, go here, and you can definitely learn how to drive a car, a car around a racetrack, right? It's this kind of thing. Um, and so it's, it's such a strong point of passion because um, for me, probably 80% of the people in the world who ever, ever tried a freaking kite, single line, dual line, quad line, I don't care what, probably gave up for something that was not their fault. The lines were uneven. The kite wasn't proofed when it came off the line in a thousand fold or, or whatever the issue was, right? So you would literally have, I'm not shitting you, you are now into a million people plus worldwide that could have tasted something awesome that everybody sitting in this room right now loves. I know that. I know all you guys love this in different ways. They never got a chance. And here's the worst part. And hear me clearly. They think it's their fault. I, I tried that. I'm no good at kites. I keep crashing kites. I know you've all heard that. I'm not going to wait for the affirmation. That is Sounds the problem. Like That's one of the root issues. 
Yeah, it's, and this is that thing. Whereas I know, Chris, if I go and step next to you for 20 minutes, baby, I will have, I, you know, I mean, just in the, even in the conversations that we've had where I'm not even training with you, you're, you're swinging that kite, mostly because you're seeing that it's real and because you have access to sensible, repeatedly proven information, which has nothing to do with me, right? It's just that this is that, this is that long issue. We, we have so few people that have been here long enough and um, a group interested enough for long enough that they have a clear understanding of, of how the system works and how to relate it to other people, right? So um, it, it, one of the things, it's just slightly out of turn, but if anybody could understand anything about the clinics and the private instruction that I do, yeah, I love it. I love kayaks. I love standing there with people working and doing it, but I really, I'm interested in their journey, right? That's, that's that key. It, it, yeah. Anyway, I, I could go on and up. Next question. Shoot. Okay, I've got one for you. Um, so obviously, <laughs> it's it's no lie that you're seen as quite an influential character in the quad line kind of world and in the kite world in general. But over your again, I call it a kite career. Who's been the influential characters to you, and who do you, in a sense, idolized or bounced off for ideas, and you know, just looked at them and with this awe? If anyone. Um, okay. So I'm, I'm sort of, I'm trimming, I'm narrowing that down on my head a little bit, not in terms of names, but in terms of the, the actual context of the question. Um, okay. So I'm going long term, right? I'm going after like 30 years. Um, I think creationally, one name that just always comes up to the top of my head and somebody that I would. I would always, always love to sit with a glass of absinthe or anything <laughs> and, 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 and listen to them just talk pros about kites for like hours. Um, and you, you're not going to be surprised, Josh. It's probably yours too. It's Carl. I, Carl Robert Shaw is, um, in my opinion, just, just one of the most amazing and brilliant um, kite minds. Um, I think, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a fun guy. He has his own character. He's been around long enough, like myself, that we kind of have our own personality and attitude a little bit. But, you, but you, what you have here with, with somebody like Carl, and there's some parallels um, with myself, although I, I would not presume to compare myself to Carl directly, is that we've been around a long time. Um, Carl is into single line. He's into dual line. He's into quad line. He's been a world championship team member. He's been a national champion individual. He's been you name it, he's already scratched it. It's done, baby. Okay, so what you have now is is a very narrow, um, what's that? Uh, 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 yeah, anyway, I, I love using pretty words, and for once a, a pretty word has escaped me, but the, oh, pantheon. Pantheon is the word I was looking on, right? So you, you talk about Olympian-class gods. Um, Carl is one of those pantheon pilots for me. He's just amazing. And, and um, you know, you watch, you watch pilots that have been around for a long time. They go through multiple phases. And Carl is one of those guys. You could be like, all right, Carl, dude, we're going to have this championship in like six weeks, right? We're just going to be flying this kind of kite. and be some shit. He's, he, hasn't, he hasn't flown in like two years, man. But he'll get, a, he'll get a team of six people together, write a routine in like, nine, in, like, in like 36 hours, show up, and then like drop the bomb, right? It's just, yep. <laughs> yeah. They're like, what? You haven't dog steak for more than an hour in your life? Good. Here, try that. An hour later, he's like doing everything. That's Carl, right? And so this is, um, that's one. The other, although, and I and I say this with the highest respect and reverence, they're just simply not as relevant now because they're not participatory. But let me tell you, brothers and sisters, 1991, 1992. Mm, just beginning in 93, right in that three-year range, is Scott Augenbaugh. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Now, I was there, so I'm going to tell you. So, so you know, at the very beginning, in the early days, you've got, uh, you got Ron Rich, you've got Lee Sedgwick, you've got Eric Wolf. Um, you know, I'm talking North American side, and there's many parallel names in the, in the UK side, but but the moral of the story is that you're dealing with nothing but 40 and 50 year olds. Still, the problem of kiting, like our whole generation, anyway. So, Scott is this 16, 17, 18, and 19 year old Hawaiian, blonde, good looking, Oakley sunglasses. Like, 
he was pepping, man. He looks good. He feels good. And what the deal was, <laughs> was not only did he look good, man, I still wear Oakley's today because that boy looks so good. <laughs> so, so the deal is. <laughs> Just left that impression so, on you. Word, man. I'll, I'll go with that. I'll go with that. So, so the deal, though, is that, you know, remember, this is the dawn. Scott is starting at the time when they have introduced standoffs, the things that hold your sail out so the kite doesn't collapse and fall out of the air. You know, these standoffs. So, so he's flying these kites, and there's a couple of things, first of all. So the first thing was that at that time, understand that there are no turtles. There are no Lazy Susans. There is no fade. Dude, the, what they have are tip stands. There's no axle. There's no half axle. They have side slides. They have tip stands, snap stalls, and fucking landings and shapes. And that's about it. Th that's it. So you have to take this limited mm, amount of stuff and do it really, really well. So one great thing was that anybody can do that at the beginning level. So it made a really easy entry door. But where Scott comes in and said, you show up, and he's got this at the time. It's up to a five-minute master's individual ballet, five minutes. So he's doing Raiders March, five minutes and 54. I know because we flew to that song for iQuad. And so he's flying this song, and I read an article. And I'm going to segue this into something more tangible. I read an article in Stunt Kite Quarterly, which Stunt Kite Quarterly, Kite Lines Magazine, KiteLife.com. Go check it out. Anyway, so he's flying in this Galveston, Texas Kite Festival. He's there with his team, High Performance from Hawaii. Also, world championships by the champions, by the way. And so he shows up in 25 miles an hour flying giant freaking kites like they did back in the day. And he flies his normal routine, his big old wind, just modifying. Now, I only read about this. So I go to the Great Lakes Stunt Kite Championship, GLSKC, one of the premier events. It was the All American that year in 92, the American Kite Magazine All American. And I'm standing there, I'm an experienced class, but I'm a judge for master's class. Now, this event is so big, they had three heats for one category. So they, they, they basically they had too many categories, too many flyers in master's ballet, for example. They had to split them up into two or three different groups. I don't remember, two or three heats. And then filter out the finalists and then have another competition just with the finalists. So the deal, though, is Scott's out there, right? Everybody else says wind rule. Which for those that are not familiar with competition, wind rule says, hey, wind is dying, put up that wind meter, and then tell me it's too little wind so I can stop. <laughs> right? So they did. They all stopped. And there's this pause. So Scott walks out, though. No, 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 I forget, man. He's got this, you know, like, I'm trying to do this head toss. You can't see it, but he's got this, this beach blonde hair, right? He does this head toss. And he goes, yeah, I'll fly. With the freaking blue mirror glasses. So sexy and cool. Right? So he's like out there. He goes out there and flies. There's no freaking wind. You're talking, okay, now no wind, understand this is 1992, is relative. So let's say it was one to three miles an hour, maybe one to four. Kites were heavy. Anyway, homeboy continues, he proceeds to do this routine that he's been doing, Raiders March, which he was undefeated for a year and a half in North American competition in sport kite competition's heyday. So you're talking, this guy showed up against 50 plus competitors more than eight events a year and held it for a year and a half. Nobody beat him in dual line ballet. This is some massive stuff. And this is when there were no trick, trick, tricks. There was no axles, none of that stuff. So everybody's using the same boat and he held it that long. But the, what, what blew me away, again, I'm going to go back to Great Lakes. I'm standing, there's no wind. And he flies his entire five minute routine on the inside of 360s. So I'm talking, he does a side slide in no wind. He just picked one side of the window to do it around, and then he locks back in, and he does a tip drag. And remember, this is 360s as a perpetual circle around yourself in order to make wind because there is no direction. So roughly eight to nine 360s, this guy does during the course of his whole routine, sometimes stroking right and left, and he does all of his normal routine, simply shifting it to whichever side he's pulling away from. Okay, he nullified the wind direction. He was greater than whatever the conditions dictated. He said, I move, therefore the kite moves. And when it's more here, I'll go that way. When it's less here, I'll go that way. But other than that, it's mine. This was that, that defining moment for me. So I want to add to that and say that 99.9999% of the flyers in the world, I don't care how freaking good you are. 
in one mile an hour, you launch, there's a tiny, tiny, tiny part of you that's waiting for it to bite. You're waiting for the wind to kick. You're waiting, you take off and you're waiting for the guy to go ka-chunk and then start flying. That's that moment, right? And this to me is that, that capital thing. There's a, a very small set of, set of flyers that have, um, uh, they become wind dependent, independent of the wind. You know? So it's a, this goes into that plus minus concept. So I think that Scott Ogdenbaugh was the first instance of someone that I saw who didn't go, oh, the wind is high or low. They said, this is the wind which is minus two or plus five or what the hell ever. And then they add or remove from the equation to get a productive result. Right? That's that is mind blowing. So that's Scott Ogenbaum. And, and, and then uh, it sticks with me today. Um, attitude, the, the, the whole bullfighter, Miguel Rodriguez, um, and a lot of other flyers over the years. But those are the two that were very influential early, early on. Um, in most recent years, um, Spence Watson. You can keep watching Spence, and we Watty. all know how incredible Watt is. Uh, <coughs> the, what's yeah. that? Yeah, Watty. Or, yeah. I, or Watty. Yeah, exactly. As... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not an O. It's an A. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. 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 But um, yeah, Spence is Spence. Honestly, because this I, I want to make sure I round out because it's such a great question, right? Is Today, like if there's one pilot that I got to like sit down and be like, okay, what's he going to do right now? Spence is one of those guys because, um, you know, we talked about like just being almost indifferent to the wind. Um, Spence is one of those guys that he has that, but then he's like, there's this other uh, incalculable potential. Like you just don't freaking know what's going to happen. He can literally drop like a bomb that nobody's ever seen if you watch him long enough. It's crazy, right? It doesn't happen very often. Spence is one of those guys. Um, and I had the pleasure to be to be alongside him um, during his, his developmental years. And, and now he's flying on his own, just, just blowing him away. And I can't wait to see what he does in the future. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, I definitely uh, am very, very fond of watching his videos. Um, now, that was mm -hmm. uh, you had some very, very cool stories then um, about and they're kind of old school. Uh, and I'm going to bring you up to to uh, sort of current times. Now, uh, it's a question that please, I like please. to ask everyone that, that comes on. Um, what is a common myth that you would personally like to get rid of in the world of kiting? A myth in the world of kiting. Okay, that's a good one. I'm, 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 I'm dredging my brain here because I, I'm in the business of, of um, demystifying myths, right? I mean, <laughs> that's my job. Exactly, so exactly, like, exactly. That. So you can yeah, pick, um, you can pick one of your your favorite ones that that you've okay. ironed out hmm. already. I, it's up to you. This is this is a simple one. It's a simple one. It has to do with tangles in the lines when you stow your lines, um, and it's one that's near, very, very near and dear to me. You'll remember my earlier sentiments is that because this is one of the things that people bump into. Um, and I think that line management is probably responsible for no less than 40% of our churn. Now, churn is that term for people try something and they don't stay or they buy it and they return it, right? So churn. Um, so line management. And, and so the myth is that we don't know what the hell is in there. <laughs> That's what the myth is. It's not a myth. It's a, it's a complete um, ambiguity and, and unclarity of what the actual dynamic at hand is. Okay, so you know, you, quad line is the most um, accelerated example of it because there's four lines involved, but I'm just going to use that is that, you know, most people, uh, I think when they enter quad, they wind up those lines and then they unwind them and they spread their handles apart and they see all these tangles. So that right there is where the myth is. And I'm going to skip most of that. I'm just going to get right down to it. Where you disprove the myth is when you land your kite or you finish your kite with no twists in it, you take your handles, I don't care if it's dual or quad, okay, whatever it is, and you put them together and you put them onto the, onto the winder. They have not spun, right? The kite had no twists in it. You put them onto the winder, they didn't spin. So you got these lines now on the winder. You're holding the handles and the winder together, for example. 
and you're winding. Now, you could do a freaking Irish jig from one end to the other. And as long as you didn't actually take the, the winder and the handles and manually rotate them or spin them, that winder can go up and down all day long, all the way to the kite end. And there's no actual twists because those ends didn't rotate. doesn't matter what happens in the middle. The four ends or two ends at the original end didn't rotate. doesn't matter. Hold them there. Come all the way to the other end, whatever end that is, and you take them off the kite or off the handles. You put them together and you wind them onto the winder, right? Where most twists and, and, and problems happen or where the mythos begins is that they take the line off and they drop it or they pick up the handle off the ground and it spins or goes through the other handle once. It's the, it's the mismanagement at either end that is actually causing the problem. So quite simply, if you take two or four or six or 10 ends of line, you put them together, put them onto a winder, you wind all the way to the other end, you do the same thing, and then you unwind and simply spread the ends apart. If you put enough tension into all the lines, it's gonna come apart. That's that is just mathematics. It's simple. So there's your mythos and there's your solution. Well, and you made uh, quite a handy video um, about that. I don't know. It, it was probably so long ago you don't mm. remember it now, John. But uh, certainly <laughs> that video was very helpful to me when I uh, was very new to quads. Uh, That'd be the, the line video management you. video. Yeah, on YouTube as well, which is it's there on free. Um, which I I want to want to kind of take a quick note is that although we do have a um, an archive, which I, I do intend to to continue expanding in Kite Life for membership videos um, on YouTube. Part of my operating baseline is that any tutorial waves that I put out is that I, I really, really need at least the first half of the intermediate um, part to be available for free on the open channels. Um, the parts of skills and learning. There's a point, right? You have to understand is that anybody who spends 30 years doing something exclusively, they have to subsidize their time. So this is that fine balance. I, I have to be able to pay my rent so I can spend eight more hours working on tutorials. That's the way that it works. However, with that in mind is that it goes back to my goal, like that first taste where someone gets that, 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 that experience of control and they, they, they're like, oh my God, it's like they get to leave their body. It's beautiful. That is that first 55 to 60 percent of tutorials so go look on youtube search my name search kite life whatever you want but there's lots of good stuff there that will at least get you up and running i will only only try to reach into your pocket for a dollar when there's something you know bigger and badder that you could either find out yourself because you're good enough now or you're just going to ask me and give me the dollar so there you go yeah, and if, <laughs> if you are new to kiting if you are new to quad lines especially uh john has got loads of very helpful videos um like it, there's lots of free videos on YouTube, loads, and like you said, there's well, plenty I, of advanced I, I, I as when you're ready. Well, and I'd be remiss, Matt, if I if I didn't round that out and and say that um, you can also check into Stack Italia, which is run by Guido Malchi, which is much harder to spell, but he's one of the greatest quad flyers in the world as well. He has a lot of tutorials through Stack Italia quad tutorials, um, some in English, quite a few in English and Italian as well. Um, and then uh, Spence Watson, Waddy, he's got some older stuff in there. There's a number of people out there putting that kind of material out. So I, I, I never want to make sure, I want to make sure they're never forgotten. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So, um, let's, let's have another one on that same subject, other than pointing people to, to kite life or your tutorial videos, someone that's completely fresh to kites, any, any kite whatsoever, how would you uh, <laughs> introduce them into the sport? I got three words in a dot com, baby. Kites are sexy dot com. And you do that with a letter R or the word A R E. Kites are sexy dot com. So I'm a kite pimp. I'm a kite peddler. That's what I do. My job is to, to, to share what I love with you. So I'm walking around for three decades going, yeah, so great. I'm glad you like this. If you want to find me later, it's B A R R E S I, right? They're not going to remember that. Um, okay, go to Kite Life. Okay, they land on this page. They don't need to know where to start. These are all kiter-related resources. So um, where I generally send, you know, I'm out at a park flying, and someone goes, oh, that's really cool. Where should I look? I go, kitesaresexy.com, baby. That's it. And they love that. So it's, it's very memorable. What that is is just a um, highlight video page of a bunch of the, um, uh, what I would call the music videos of kite flying that I've put out myself. 
Um, and while there's a lot of great things to share, the main thing was that I, I just needed something quick and memorable. And so I literally, so I'll be like buying my groceries. I go, yeah, I'm doing this because I'm going to play kites this weekend. They go, fly kites? I go, yeah, I do that for a living. They go, oh? And I go, yeah, check it out. Kitesaresexy.com. And I'm walking away, right? They finish the transaction. I go, kites are what? And they go, sexy. I go, dot com. And then we leave. It's just, it's a pitch, right? It's full of energy. So anyway, that's the answer. Kites are sexy, dot com. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. You get quite a nice uh, a URL there. So, yeah, not not easy to forget. <laughs> yeah, that I, was the point. I actually seen you drop that earlier on Facebook and spent my morning on it. It was pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it goes, uh, it goes back pretty far. There's, um, I think, the earliest video in that archive. You actually go all the way back because it is um, chronological. I think it's 1993 in Hawaii probably the earliest um there's some photos that are earlier but that's the earliest video i've been able to find now john i have one last final question for myself i can't speak for the rest of these guys but uh i like to do something in every segment where i like to ask every guest what are five mm -hmm. i love this segment dude this is the only reason i'm on the show chris is these que these three questions man these guys are good but you're better go I would like to know, for the absolute beginner, what are five tips that you could share with us? Mm, absolute beginner, five tips. Do less. When you launch, wait for it to happen, right? Wait for it to happen. And you put in that little bit of right input, wait to see what it does. It's that, that kind of maturity, right? Um, when we launch, typically, as a beginner, we are immediately like left, right, left, right. Like it, it becomes an oscillation, if you're familiar with, with that term. So it, it, you basically just starts getting crazier and crazier and crazier and crazier and it keeps rising. So you're reacting to problems. Whereas with a kite, if it's set up well, you should be able to take off and just don't do a damn thing. And it should be able to go straight. And then you can incrementally try one simple input, bong, see it travel down the line, hit the kite, get a result, and straighten out again. So that's one. Um, number two, number two, um, task yourself. We're talking about five for beginners. Task yourself. And so um, what I mean by that is that um, no right or wrong. We're just talking game here. If you're out in the field and you're trying to – generally control the kite right so you take off and it starts going left and you're oh crap and you got and you turn it right and it's oh crap now you got to go left so you're eventually basically you're responding to ways you don't want to go the whole time but instead before you ever take off if you simply say hey i'd like to take off and touch somewhere on the right side then somewhere on the left side and then crash somewhere in the middle right you literally went a b c and you know for a fact, in a recordable sense, that you accomplished what it was you were trying to do. Whereas in many cases, you launch and you're just in the survival mode. You don't really have that way marker that says, yep, you tried to go there. You kind of mostly made it, and then you kind of mostly made it back. So um, uh, small successes is what we would call that. Um, let's see. So that's two. Uh, three. Um, it's a little bit early, but consider the idea of vocabulary. So we're controlling the kite, but it is a thing of control. So um, vocabulary, simply expand. Uh, you can do a circle. You can do something that looks like a square. You can hover out on the left side, and then you can hover out on the right side. There any of these variation of things. And once you have five or ten things, specifically, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to go over there and do that, and then I'm going to go over here and do that. Now you have some process that is going to accelerate your learning quite a bit as opposed to just launching and then responding to whatever the wind or nature or the unknown throws at you. Um, that's three. Let me see here. If you can, um, get down with the tunes, man. Get down with the tunes. Um, whatever that is. And it might be it might be a Blue Danube waltz or it might be Eminem, you know, like didn't mean to give you Mushrooms Girl. <laughs> no, I like I like giving that girl mushroom. Like it's just, I'm I'm a hip hop guy myself. Um, so what I'm after is cadence. So almost everything. If you go back and watch my videos, there's as some do cadence. That's why I'm going to the music. So whether it's a waltz, which is like don't 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 don't, it's longer, it's longer. So it's a it's it's like two or three things in 15 seconds. Hip hop is like boom 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 boom. Boom, 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 boom. It's a, it's just, 
is recurring. So the actual beat count or the, the what I would call the draw, it's drawing me to do something. The actual content count increases per 10 seconds. Um, so having music that moves you, that's the key. Um, and within that music, it should be a tempo that gives you the time to do this, your skills process, and then you go, oh, yeah, I'll do that. That speed is not the same for all pilots. It will get faster as you get better. But, um, yeah, pick music that just kind of guides you somewhere. Um, that was four. What's five? Um, oh, the best, the best, the best is um, it's about iterations. So we as humans, um, especially now, and remember, I've trained literally thousands of people. We're talking not like a one-hour lesson, but like a weekend of working with people. I've trained with thousands of people. We, and myself included, but I work with this consciously, is, is that when we try something and we fail, okay, or hell, if we do anything, and we have a dialogue. Okay, other people can't hear it, but inside your own head, you have a dialogue, and everybody's is different. And some are more constructive than others are less constructive. Um, and, they're, and they're not yours. They were picked up somewhere, somewhere in early life, typically. But um, when I'm instructing, for example, and someone crashes, there's a few ways that will come out. They, they're flying and they crash and go, ah. and that sound itself, that's an opinion. It's an attitude about their own failure. It's an attitude about the, the attempt and the, it's, it's everything, right? It's, um, and so subtly during the instruction process, we, we nip away at these things. And, and most of it is not uh, elimination, but mostly replacement. So where I'm going with this is that you could try one thing and then you have an opinion about how well you did it, but the wind was random and your physicality was, and there's all sorts of variables that go on with every single attempt that you make. But if you go up and you try the same thing five times, so let's say, okay, I'm, I'm on the ground, right? I'm going to take off. I'm going to do a left circle and then I'm going to land again. Okay. So one, I'm always going to mess something up. If it's not on the right side, it'll be on the left side because it's all variables. But if I do it five times, right? So I, I'm, and here I am. I take off. I do my left circle, and I land. And I go five, four, three, two, one. And I do it again. Take off, left circle, land. And again, five, four, three, two. The point is that the countdown takes the space that my brain would usually be given some dialogue, some worthless opinion about what happened. That was good. That was bad. I'm good. I'm bad. Right? Do it five times. Once you've done it five times, now you can sit in your chair for 30 seconds and consider the recurring problems and the recurring successes. And by using this method, right? So again, we've just simply done it five to 10 times before you give yourself any grief. And then you have some fair data on which to behave, right? And remember that when you try it five times, your very first time, expect to fail five times. Your next time, you might get it one out of five. Maybe the next 10 times, one out of five. But then it'll become two out of five. You're going to hold that for a minute, and all of a sudden you'll be like three out of five, and then four out of five. You get this jump. You get this, this exponential leap, and then you'll backslide. I mean, back to two out of five. This, right, so for me, the way that I play is, is, is mostly on long odds. It's on statistics. So I want to be 80%, 85% successful at something to bring it into my daily game. I want to be 90%, 95% successful for stuff that I, I'm going to take like on the everyday anywhere. And there's certain things like when I'm, if I'm hired to do an indoor show for Cavalia Circus in Abu Dhabi for the Royal family, I only do the things that I hit 100% of the time. So it becomes that awareness of percentage and, um, and, and removing the, the opinion about it. Right. This, 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 <laughs> there's no, there's no, there's no narrative. It's worthless. Either it is or it isn't, or you add to it or you take away from it. Right? There's no opinion. The opinion gets in the way. That's my point about that. We do the same thing on my teams as well because um, when we run at that high speed, I do freestyle calling. And so my team members sometimes will fall off the track, and then their first response will be to get down on themselves, which actually redoubles the problem. So instead what we train in my team lines because we run at such a high speed is, is, is uh, the way I term it is stone-cold assassin. You have no opinion on this. You have no room to have an opinion. You're not entitled to have an opinion. Your only job is the next thing that happens, not what's happening right now, not what happened a second ago. So therefore, any problem which doesn't exist in the future, it only exists in the past, doesn't exist anymore, does it? Next. 
That's my point. So anyway, um, yeah, that's my five answers for beginners. Have fun. <laughs> yes, awesome, awesome, awesome uh, five points. Now, um, we're, we're pretty much on the hour mark, so we're, we're going to wrap up. But the, uh, Good, the I'm just getting started. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we're, we've, got, we've got tons of shows worth of, of material, so we're definitely going to have to have you back. Um, now, this one mm -hmm. I think Good. is probably going to be impossible. Uh, for you to answer because I don't even think you can contemplate it. Um, I love a challenge. But in a in a world where uh, you're not flying kites and kites have not been part of your life for the last 30 years, uh, what would you be doing instead? Mm. Mm. Uh, actually, I do have an answer, surprisingly enough. I When I was, I don't know, somewhere 9 to 12 years old, um, there was some some conversation I was having with my father, and it never it never leave me. But I, I remember that basically he described to me that other than people in power who are who are working to 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 monopolize their their assets and all these things, for the most part, most conflict in the world arrives from a lack of ability to communicate the middle line. And because generally we know that if we have all able bodies in a mind or all able minds in a room. They will derive the middle point so that everybody can keep eating and breathing and have the most. There will still be people with more and people with less, but the idea is that the organism works together and nobody actually dies out. Um, when I was young, my um, oddly enough, I, I don't know where I came in, but when I was 10, 12 years old, I, I consider being a mediator of some kind, um, being between two people that just couldn't quite and then help provide the linguistics and the perspective that would show where it meets in the middle. Um, not to say that they will ever agree. That's not my purpose. That's not the point. But the fact is that there's a functional line, and that's what mediators do. So, yeah, I wanted to be a mediator of some kind. And, and I think that, by and large, um, and I found myself actually in mediating uh, positions in the community between manufacturers and things in the, in the past. But, um, but the main thing is that um, most of the conflict that I find is not, um, as I say, it's not based in absolutes. It's based in a moment of miscommunication or a moment where somebody is so used to just, just taking everything that they didn't know that they could have just left five out of 100 as scraps and then perpetuate something else. It's all that subtlety. Um, and that's, that's probably where I would have spent my time. I don't know how that would have manifested, but um, that's been on my mind very early, and it's a big part of what I, what I do um, every day, I think. Yeah, that's awesome. That's, um, yeah, it's, that's, that's a very interesting answer. Very interesting answer. Um, okay, well, look, John, um, I'm going to wrap up. I know, I know that will be frustrating for you because you, you, this is your <laughs> life, uh, and you can talk. Go, let me go. <laughs> I'm yep. really, really hoping that um, you will actually come back because uh, I'm sure everybody at home will want to hear more from you. Oh man, I, you know, Matt, I, 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 I would never want to monopolize anything, but like, I, I would love to have a room where we can talk about quad team. I, I can sure. open up two rooms on oh, that, well, on that we, alone, you know. So will, like, this is, this is. I can already see that this is an event uh, that we're gonna, we are we're down. gonna have to do very, very soon. Maybe you can talk uh, right Brett right into on. joining one of these. Yeah. I have had a zero oh, luck so far. Oh yeah, um, I, 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 you know, nobody's um, other than the the the, the free the gin talk that he and I had um, for the benefit of our customers. Um, we haven't really had a, a sit down or an expose on the gin before, and 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 bring some insights into the build side. Um, you know, and it just warrants to say because we've mentioned so many other things. Um, um, I, the, the, the gin would not exist without Brett's um, contributions and his knowledge and influence. Um, quite simply, I am so far ADD that I'm just not like, I will build a one-off prototype and my luck is stupid good. I will tell you, like I'll make a, an ugly, beautiful kite. It flies really well. It's ugly. And then I give it to somebody who really knows how to make it. <laughs> That's the deal. Um, and Brett is one of those guys and he knows how to fly it really well. So yeah, I, I'd love to sit in a couple of chairs with Brett and, uh, and, and share some ideas and just listen to him. You are, I cannot, I cannot wait for that. That's going to be a lot of fun. Mm. We'll, we will definitely can make, I, can make I, it happen. Yeah, go, you go for it. Uh, all right. So let me, let me throw out a few closers. Um, let's see. Yeah. So if, if, if anybody, any of your listeners at, at on the line want to check out my personal stuff, 
me as a, as a, as a loud mouth, braggadocious kite flying a-hole. That is me. I am a kites are sexy.com. That goes right to my video page. Um, KiteLife.com is an online magazine that's archived. We don't produce articles anymore, but it's a huge archive. We've also archived kite lines and stunt kite quarter lean full print magazines in PDF format. KiteLife.com, free to explore all that stuff. You can be a member and get some other stuff, but it's free. Go look. Um, TeamKiteLife.com, that's me and my homies. Um, these are people that I've gravitated to for their verve, for their skill, for their love, for the depth of their hearts and the depth of their minds. Um, Team Kite Life, great people. Um, and then, of course, Kite Forge, F-O-R-G-E, like forged from the fires of the kite fields. Um, Kiteforge.com is, is where we, we uh, make available the kites that we use to other people that might be interested in them. So those are my plugs. Um, other than that, you know, go check out DK and, and everything else. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's some very good plugging and uh, that's what we like. We like some plugging on here so that everyone uh, can find out even more about the guests. Now I want to say, um, um, I'm, 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 I'm shameless. I'm shameless. Right. And, and, and matter of fact, I, I just want to say officially for the record, before we turn off the recorder, I am a little upset that you not read my contract because there was, as I walked into the studio here, there should have been one full bowl of green M&Ms and a shaved goat to my left. I got the M&Ms. I got no goat. I'm really upset. <laughs> uh, we had, the, who do I talk to? There was a major uh, issue with the goat. Yeah. We oh, wanted Chris Kira. kept the goat. I, I got it. Chris yeah. kept the Chris goat. Chris was in charge of the goat. <laughs> I, I was had in a hankering for euros. I just I had to make them. <laughs> nice one. Good one. Good one. So, I'll go with that. So I do want to say a massive, massive thank you to John because mm. um, you came in at the last minute. Um, it was exceptionally short notice. I think I think I officially asked you. It was still yesterday when I when I asked you, and uh, you immediately it, it, it was this morning for plate. me when yeah. you asked me. Yeah, exactly. You <laughs> stepped up to the plate and said, "Yeah, sure. Yeah, let let, let me have it. Let me have it." So that you know was, what you just 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 make sure you tell just make sure you tell the ladies I'm good in a pinch. That's that's enough for me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, ladies. <laughs> yeah, John's good, great in a pinch. Um, I want to say massive thank you to obviously both my co-hosts Chris and Josh. Um, yeah, you, you keep driving me to keep doing the the bits and and so on and so forth. And everyone mm -hmm. at home, the feedback has been exceptional and and far greater than than we could have uh, possibly imagined. I know I keep saying it, but um, honestly, it's very humbling to have such a great response from the bits and pieces. Um, let me, let, let me, I'm going to hijack that for, for like 30 seconds and just say that I, again, 30 years, I've seen a lot, a lot of um, well-intended podcast attempts and, and various things come online. And um, you guys have been doing an excellent, excellent job. And I've, I've really enjoyed um, listening to everything. So I will, I will continue being a subscriber. Thanks, John. That means a lot. That really does Thank mean you. a that lot. Thank you. That means the world. Now, it's very, right very late for me and Josh, um, but <laughs> I'm still going to say, because I'm going to go to the effort of editing this very, very quickly, so tomorrow being Sunday, um, it will be the third part, part three of the live build along series with the mini pulse. So 8 p.m. UK. Uh, don't ask me about the different time zones because I just don't know. I know bring your coffee. Cause just bring the whiskey. Cold. Yeah, we're gonna. It's gonna be extra long. Uh, there's gonna be. It's gonna be packed full of interesting little tidbits. Um, we're gonna. Yeah, it's gonna be an extended version. So everyone is welcome. Please come along. You can join us in Zoom. You can watch on YouTube. You can watch on Facebook Live. So yes, from everyone in here, thank you very much and. Um, We'll see you soon. Say goodbye, everyone. Thank you very see much you for coming. Good night, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>